to come up and preach this second message. Lord, thank you so much for the opportunity to hear the preaching of the Word of God. We thank you, Father, for uh, Evangelist Burden. We thank you for how you use him. We pray that you would bless this time as we hear the preaching. Help us with teachable spirits. Help us with undivided attention. And draw us, we pray, close to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Hey, well, I'm going to take this second opportunity that we have and treat it kind of like a Sunday school type message as we look into the Word of God as something else. And I am going to go and we're going to be speaking on something that I believe that is very relevant and I understand as well that we've got to have i got to define what I'm speaking on very clearly because I do want to be very clear that I'm not saying I'm an expert upon any of these matters, but it really does help at least to have an understanding of where I'm coming from. You know, I mentioned in the bio, in the bio that I'm a computer guy. I enjoy computers and different nerdy things and stuff, and I enjoy getting really good deals and stuff on different electronic items. And uh, one of the things that is really interesting, if you've ever had a computer, you've probably been victim of a computer virus before. What it does is something gets into the, the CPU, the computer, starts slowing down some of the processes and stuff. And even though it's sometimes, in some cases, it can be still functioning, it's not functioning at its highest ability at that time. You know, I believe that there is sometimes a virus, quote unquote, that has come within the church. And even though the church is functioning, and even though we are still doing certain things, we're not doing them at the output that we normally have been in the past. And that virus, so to speak, that I will speak to is stress, anxiety, and depression. I have never seen it like in all my days. As far as on the rise of what we have seen, no, no, I'm, I mean, I'm talking pre-pandemic, I'm talking pre-2020 type things is the rise of these areas. Um, different medications being prescribed, different people not coming to church because of certain tendencies of, of having attacks and different things at church. Um, teenagers now on suicide watch that I would preach to, it's become more and more of a pressing need. So I, I think that obviously the Bible will be able to talk, talk about everything concerning life. And I want us to think of it. And as I do, I, I am not going to, I am not speaking in one Sunday school lesson type thing on only on uh, the entire act of the stress, anxiety, and depression. I do see them as very different. And so here's how I'm going to do my best to define each of these ones. And then I'm going to tell you how it is that we're, which one we're going to be looking at. All right, I want to make sure I'm in within the camera range. And I'm probably going to be talking right here, even though there is a live audience here at the camera. And so with that being said, can you see both of these chairs right here? Okay. With that being said, I'm going to define first stress, anxiety, and depression. Then I want to tell you the direction that we're going to go. So over here, I'm going to let this chair, it's going to, re it's going to represent expectations. Okay? Um, expectations is that which we are hoping to happen. The, uh, the life that I, I think I should be having. Um, how much money I should be making. And how my kids should be doing. Um, what exactly in the stage of life I'm in. How effective, how influential, etc. So these are, like any person has, expectations of what they think life should be. Over here is reality. <laughs> Here's how much you really make in a year. Here's how your kids really are. Here is what things are actually happening inside of your life. Like it or not, reality has a way of making all of our aspirations and come to the great equalizer. And you look and you say reality. So over here is expectations. Over here is reality. I define stress as this. Stress is standing in between these two and trying to make your expectations a reality. And sometimes what happens is, it's a position of reaching out and trying to pull this and make this happen, okay? Like, no, I don't make this, but, but I sure am going to make this a reality. My kids are not, but I'm sure going to make these things take 
place, and the place in the middle is stress. <laughs> That's where it's a stressful place to be to consistently let your defining areas of your life is taking expectations and making them a reality. Let's not get into the dynamic of what if it's wrong, what if it's a good expectation. Let's not get into the dynamic of that right now. But I am saying is just by definition, it's a stressful place to be. Now, anxiety is this. This is different. Because again, I believe these are, these, are, these are not all the same, obviously. Anxiety is, is when you put your back to reality and just stare at expectations. It's when, wow, maybe I'll never be this way. Maybe I will never make this much money. Like reality is not even in the picture. We don't really think, and it's really not something that comes up in the mind. It's just focusing, focusing, and focusing on expectations, what I should be doing, what my goals were, what this is supposed to happen, and it can make us into an anxious state. Okay, for me, I remember the time that I remember my, I guess you call it anxiety attack to some degree, what I was in, a co I was in college with Pensacola, and uh, part of the college, I traveled to the college, and I went to a church, it was so different. The path was an avid surfer, and he wanted me to go surfing. I didn't even know how to swim, folks, but he wanted me to go surfing. I went out surfing, surfing. <laughs> and uh, I got out there, like a long story short, I got taken out by a rip current. I, I remember looking back at the, at, the, at the seashore and seeing people that were this big. And I remember at that point, here's literally how I survived. I would take myself and put myself in the ball. I'd go to the bottom, hit the floor of the ocean, I would jump up at that point, obviously hold my breath the whole way, jump up, take a breath, ball myself down again, and do the same thing. And I would repeat that process, and every time I'd come up, I would scream for help. I don't remember how long I repeat that process, but one of the last times I came up, I remember I put into the ball, came up, screamed help, but when I did, salt water poured into my throat. At that point, I gargled, I did not get my breath. When I went down, I knew I'm going to die. I remember as I went down, I level with the water. I remembered a surfer making their way, and they took a surfboard, and they slapped their surfboard toward my face. I don't know how to swim, but I began moving every part of myself, and I was able to stay afloat long enough to grab that surfboard. I remember when I grabbed that surfboard and got myself to land and all this stuff, and the surfer that saved me. I remember um, it, was, it was weeks before I slept through the night. You know why? Adrian, you survived. Look at the reality. You survived. You survived. I could have died. <laughs> I was this close. I mean, like, I literally saw my face like, Adrian, you are. So then I was focused on the expectations or even the possibilities of what could have been in my life, that even though I was fine, I was healthy, my family's okay, my kids are healthy now, and I was still focused on all the expectations or the possibilities. Now again, we're just defining before we go to the passage. And then there's depression. So stress between these two. Anxiety is when you're focused on the, rea on the expectations and possibilities. And then depression is this. The best one word on definition I know of depression is hopelessness. Because you say, because at this point, you lose all expectation in reality. You come to the point of having no hope. That's why it's hard to tell a person who's truly depressed, well, have faith, brother. Well, when you go to Hebrews 11, 1, the Bible says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. If you have no hope, you don't have the stuff to make the faith. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? It's like coming to a point of thinking that there's absolutely nothing that can change, whether it's between the reality, the reality or the expectation or the possibilities. These two combined cannot produce hope. Now, each of these are very real. Stress, anxiety, depression. Now, I am only going to speak on one because obviously the Bible addresses all of these. However, I want us to take our Bibles and go to 1 Samuel chapter number 30. And in 1 Samuel 30, I think we're going to read here the one that is addressed the second anxiety. anxiety. I want to talk about that during this Sunday School lesson together, anxiety. 
First Samuel chapter number 30, here's what's going on. David and his men, this is David's been anointed to be the king, yet he's not king yet. Saul's trying to kill him, and uh, Saul's kind of killed him. He's been on the run. Then you look here in 1 Samuel chapter number 30, in verse number, we're going to go through one, actually we're going to read 1 through 6 here. The Bible says this, and it came to pass when David and his men, 1 Samuel 30, verse number 1, and come to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south, and Ziklag had smitten Ziklag with fire, and burned it with, smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire. And had taken the women captives that were therein, and they slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So David's men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives, and their sons, and their daughters were taken captive. Then David and the people that were with him lift up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. David, two wives, were taken captive, the Hinnom, the Jezreelites, Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughter, daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. And David said to Abiathar the priest, Elimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And, David, and Abiathar brought thither the ephod to David. And David inquired at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered them, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. Here's what I want to do. I want to be able to teach us a, a discipline. You know, I believe there's certain disciplines that we find in the Bible that we might not make common to our Christian life. For example, lamentations. I believe it's a discipline in the Christian life to learn how to lament. There's a biblical way. If I would have given us an entire book of the Bible of, lam of lamenting, if that wasn't supposed to be some discipline within the Christian life. This discipline that I want to speak to is this discipline of preaching to yourself in the Christian life. Let's have a word of prayer as we do this lesson together. Father, thank you for the Bible. Thank you for you teach us. Thank you, Lord, for our, for our good spirit here at Grace Baptist. I pray that you would use the time that we have. Well, I pray for those watching and different things that you would just take your word. For those that might be kind of struggling with this area of stress, anxiety, depression, trying to sort things out in their own heart and mind. God, give great grace and wisdom and understanding in these specific areas. That I pray that you would just use your word to speak to us. Thank you all that you've done and will do in Christ and we pray it all. Amen. I know this is going to sound very trite, but I do love to preach, and I love listening to preaching. I make it a habit. Before any priest I preach, I listen to Pastor Holloway preach. I listen to, you're going through Matthew chapter number 5, the Beatitudes currently in Matthew chapter number 5. I enjoy preaching. I enjoy listening to wherever I'm going, pastors and people all over the country and all over the world. When I was a kid, I could even listen to, um, I could listen to a preacher's voice tell you pretty much um, where they're, pretty much who it was just by their voice and even what passage, depending on the passage, tell you what direction they were going to go. My sermon, my, my sermon, my job when I was at Pensacola Christian College is I was the sermon editor. Every sermon that was preached at Pensacola, I would take the sermon and I would make it prep for radio, make it 28 minutes and 15 seconds. And so in my time, I have heard a lot of preaching. And not only hearing a lot of preaching, but I have learned that, you know, you have, and if you go back in history, the classic sermons, Sinners in the Hands of the Angry God, you know, Jonathan Edwards, um, uh, let's see, Vance Havner, everything he's preached, basically. Um, um, why Revival Terrors, Raven, um, uh, forgot, Raven Hill, Leonard Raven Hill. Um, one of the classics of current, close current time, Dr. Law and Dr. Grace by Lester Law. Like, sermons that, once they were preached, it were instantly messages where, what? Huh, I must hear that and actually hear that message again. But there will be no greater message in your life that you will ever hear. In the time when the God takes, when the Holy Spirit of God mounts the pulpit of your own heart, and He preaches to you specifically. See, I want to go through because David here, we know that verse number six, David incurs himself in the Lord his God. Adrian, that's where you're going, right? And that's when we say David preached to himself, but he started preaching to himself long before that. Okay, so what I'm going to do is take the mechanics of building a sermon and take you through how David preached a sermon to himself. This is a teaching time, but I think we can follow this together. David preached a sermon to himself. So, number one, when preaching a service, uh, and actually, I know that you probably can't do this, those that are watching, but if you're here in a live audience, can I ask this question? If you've ever created, put together a devotional or something to share with others, whether it's a ladies' meeting, whether it was like maybe some type of 
but you put verses together to share with a group of people. Would you raise your hand if you've done that before? Okay, I mean, if you have put together something to share with you, you can put your hands down. Now, if somebody asks you to preach, one of the first things you got to do is this. Who's your audience? You know? I mean, who are you preaching to? And he said, how about the preparation? You preach to the kids? You preach to the adults? You preach to the teenagers? Is it all men's group? Is it all ladies' group? What's the point? Who is your audience? The beautiful thing about preaching to yourself is you know the audience very well. Because <laughs> yourself. And not only that, look in David's life. Okay? The audience. Verses 1 through 3 shows the audience who David is speaking to. David's position in his life is literally, he is living a lie. Here's what David's doing. David has gone, he is, he, he, I believe he's in a point of stress, expectation, I'm supposed to be the king. The reality, Saul is trying to kill me in this pursuit of being the next king. So he then turns his back on reality and does something that's so crazy, he goes into Philistine territory. He begins to act like a madman, and what he does is he then goes to the king, and he will, the king of the Philistines, and he will plunder a city, kill everybody in the city, everybody, take all the spoils, go to the king of the Philistines and say, I took off one of the Israelite cities, and here is the spoil. The Philistines were like, wow, you're the man. This is incredible. In fact, we're going to give you a city. They gave him the city of Ziklag. This is your city. You just keep doing your thing and working for us. And every now and again, what did he do? He'd take his men, 400 guys. They would go out, 600, 400, 600, I can't remember right now. 400, 600, it's Bible scholar. I don't know. He took his 400, 600 men, and he would go out. And then after he would do that, he'd kill him and go to another city. That was Philistine. Kill everybody in the city so there's no witnesses. Take some of the spoil. Hey, Philistine king, here's what we've done. The man is living a lie. So the first aspect of preaching yourself is knowing the audience. David knew the exact position he had in his life. He knew this was not a sustainable model. This is not the plan. So as you continue in this matter, before you get to the part where you see that David's encouraging himself in the Lord, the second part is, okay, so you know your audiences. You know you're preaching to. So then you start seeing in verse 4 through 6, you see what is the problem or what is the conflict that is taking place. I, I mean, basically, the Word of God answers what's going on in people's lives. So I'm not even thought through this really, but let's say what I preached um, this morning about Habakkuk. And the, the conflict is individual as Christians is hard to live by faith. And we must see that necessity is the Word of God says that we as Christians of anybody got to live by faith. So what? The beautiful thing about preaching to yourself is life circumstances usually will show you the conflict. <laughs> Look at David's life, okay? In verse number 4 through 6, you see David went and uh, they went to Ziklag and you see that the city was destroyed, verses 4 through 6. So what happened is they come back. Um, they're getting ready to go on another one of these conquests. The Philistine king says, hey, David, we're going to go fight Israel this time. You come along. David said, sure, I'll come along. What he was going to do, I have no idea. But he's going to probably attack the Philistines. But he said, one of the generals said, no, 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 no. This guy, no, 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 no. This guy is not coming with us on this raid. I guess this guy's going back. I don't trust him. The king apologized to David. said, David, I'm so sorry, but you can't come. David's like, oh, I want a third, the Lord, the king. I want a third, the Lord, the king. And he plays it up. But still, the guy goes, I don't trust him. Go back. David's like, okay. <laughs> Take this man. And then they're kind of, you know, can you imagine them joking and laughing with each other? Like, <laughs> he really thought we were going to really help him. All these years, we've got this guy full. And they start nearing their city. Ziklag, their home. They can see fire in the distance. At this time, they do not know all that's taking place, but they know that it's burned to the ground. This is the conflict. See, the thing about preaching yourself is life circumstances will dictate the conflict that God is getting ready to do inside of your heart and your life. So he goes through, the conflict is this. You have 600 men who have gathered together who believe their families are all dead. Can you imagine being in a room with that many people? I was in a room with a bunch of teenagers who were cheering for their teen at Teen Extreme Physical. They were cheering and yelling. I mean, even if you're not happy, you kind of smile a little bit just because of the electric excitement inside of the room. Could you imagine the direct opposite of that? Of, of sadness. 
You have men that are beating the ground. You have men that are scratching the trees. You have men that are called curled up into a ball. You have people that are screaming. You have people that are sitting in silence. You have men of all different types that are grieving in their own way. This is the conflict. Broken men with broken hearts. In fact, they go to David. It's not only a public struggle, but it's a personal struggle for David as well. Because they said to David, we're going to stone you. Now, the word that they use is a Hebrew euphemism, like a saying. The saying is, we're going to cover you with rocks. So you said that means stoning. It means more than that. It means, David, we hate you so much that we are going to stone you. And you will die. And after you die, we will continue to cover your body with rocks. After your death, we will still continue to pummel you with stones. We hate you that much. They're using some pretty strong language. To talk about David. So you see that life circumstances dictated... What's getting ready to happen? So, in a message, who's your audience? Well, David knew his audience <laughs> and knew where his standing was with the God. What's the conflict? Well, life circumstances show him what the conflict is. Now, let's continue. 6b. The Bible says this, but David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Now, um, obviously, in the mechanics of, of sermon preparation, sermon study, which I am very passionate about, is that you just you just don't you you're not going to just um, find an idea that you want to speak on and just try to find a verse to kind of back you up? But what does the passage say? <laughs> what does the Word of God say? And you simply share the truth of what the Bible is saying. You know, hence you have hobby horse type thing of let me just find something and let me just kind of go. And obviously, God may give the thought of an idea first, but still letting the Word of God speak more. So then you see David in his life. Okay. So I, I like this to study the passage fervently, but now David's studying his faith fervently. Look down, verse number six. Um, because all the soul of the people was grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters, but David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Now, this is important because it's not just David encouraged himself in the Lord. That Lord, Jehovah, had to be his God. So, um, some people say, you know what, I, I just hope preacher has a good word. You know, I'm going through a lot right now. Conflict has happened inside of my life right now. Anxiety is building up inside of me right now. And there's nothing wrong with praying that God will use the man of God to give you a word from the word of God. But it could be that God has orchestrated these conflicts inside of your life for you to deepen your faith in the Lord, your God. Pastor Holloway's God is going to encourage me. But when God becomes my God, it changes me. When I then understand that it's not just some good word he's given me, but this is my word that God has given to me. When I get inside of his book, and it's just like reliving somebody else's circumstances versus living the circumstances in yourself. David encouraged himself in the Lord, not just stopping there, but the Lord, his God. Have I ever, look, I'm all for this. God, keep everyone safe. You know, my girls kind of have that sniffy nose and different things. God, keep her safe. There's nothing wrong in that prayer. The prayer of faith shall save the sick. But if God so chooses something that he had allowed something in my life, that one of the first things I might need to investigate is this. God, what could you possibly want me to learn during this conflict you have brought to my life? That means the Holy Spirit of God then has the opportunity to then mount upon the pulpit of my own heart to have an opportunity to teach me what he wants me to know about himself. David then, you see in this passage, 
encourages himself in the Lord his God, and he looks for the solution, I guess you could say, the solution biblically. You say, what does he do biblically? Look in verse 7, he says, And David said to Abiathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephah. And Abiathar brought thither the ephah to David, and David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. All right, so we see that David, first, just like any construction of a message, if you've ever put a message together, you got to know who you're preaching to. <laughs> you know, you got to know what, what exactly. So you've got, got the context. David knew the context of where his life was. What is the conflict? What is the thing that you're answering from the Word of God? Then you're going to go for the solution biblically. What does God say? And as you look at the solution biblically, what does God have to say? This is what David does. He goes over. He encourages himself in the Word of God. This is my God. I must trust my God in this situation. I can't wait till Wednesday night. I can't wait till Sunday morning. I can't wait for the next word to come down from the podcast episode of my favorite preacher. I need God right now. Okay? So then he goes. Encourage himself and the Lord is God. Then he goes to the Bible. What's so significant about this? He starts taking the steps he knows he needs to take of dependence upon God. He goes straight to the priest. Could you imagine? Again, people are crying all around him. People are threatening his life. And he's like, hey, guys, guys, I need you to move. I need you to move. For him to get himself up to move those guys out of the way, he says, abide by from here. Now it's believed that um, when he brought in, uh, the, the, the oracles of God, that they were stones that if God wanted you to do something, the stones would glow. Or if it was black stones, white stones, and then some of the stones would change to the other color. There's lots of ideas of what exactly it meant. But basically, he brings over the ephod, and he then is seeking God's help about what to do in this circumstance. And he goes to Abiathar, he prays and said, talk to God, we're talking to God, get the ephod on, and everything. Shall I pursue after this truth? Okay? Now, to Abram, what on earth does this have to do with anxiety? Here it is. Okay? Because David, to be able to get up and to be able to then ask God what he needed to do next, he had to let the word of God speak. Now, real quick, Psalm 16, Psalm 16. This is believed to be the psalm that happened during this. This is the psalm that was penned during this time. Okay, Psalm 16. So back to the illustration, and then I'm going to read some of the verses in Psalm 16. All right, so David's here. Back to this illustration here of reality. Um, the reality is this of, you know, um, my family's been taken away. I think my family's dead. There are 600 men who want to kill me, and uh, this is not cool, <laughs> really, over here. Then on this side, here is the expectation reality. I need to do something about this. I need to fix it. So anxiety would then say that you turn your back on all reality, and then here's when you let the word of God speak. Is sometimes we could be sitting right here and know that God knows all and what is best. So you have David spinning this psalm around this same time frame and saying, Preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust. He says in verse 8, I have set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Verse 10, For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer that holy one to see corruption. You say, what is he saying? He's saying that in circumstances that he's currently in, God, I don't feel that you are at my right hand right now, but your word says you are. <laughs> and I'm going to have to trust your word more than my feelings right now. I am going to have to trust that you do know what's going on. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Lord, right now, <laughs> I do have a bunch of people who are staring at me and want to take my life. And I do feel like my soul is separated from you. But I'm trusting that your word says you would never, you would not leave my soul in hell. He said, Thou wilt show me the path of life in thy presence is fullness of joy. God, I don't feel like in your presence. I'm trying to seek your presence. What he's saying is this. It's just like the, what we just talked about, about living by faith. is letting the word of God speak louder than my emotions. Amen. 
letting the word of God speak more than what I think should be happening in my life. Amen. He said, Adrian, use a broken record. All you be preaching about is faith. We got saved by faith. Amen. We got to live by faith, man. Amen. Not just when we watch the news. We got to live by faith when my mind gets out of control. We can't live in our mind when we got to think to ourselves, man, this will never happen. Things are going to always be this way. Things are never going to change. What he's saying is, this is the opportunity for God then to take his word and let it speak louder than what you think. That's why David got up. This story would have ended right here if David had then let anxiety take control. He would have never got up. He would have never sought through a by car. He would have been right here. Guess what he would have done? Made an emotional decision and not a God-led decision. Could have been right. He could have been gone after him, and maybe God blessed it. But he said, I, of anybody, have to be able to think clearly to be able to see what God wants me to see here. And I can't make a critical decision with my emotions on my shoulders right now. So then he says, he gets up, he starts talking to the Bible. So he gets, looks for the solution biblically about preaching to yourself. Then one more thing, you see here this sermon that he's preaching to himself, is I find that in an invitation, I mean, I, everyone's different, I'm invading someone a little bit different, but I preach for an invitation. Like, you ain't gonna walk around, like I try to make, you ain't not gonna scratch your head and walk out and say, what was he trying to say? You know, I, I, I strive. That you know, we agree on living by faith. You know what I'm saying? Like that you know there's an invitation. Usually questions. Typically at the end of a message, there are questions. Like, now what are you gonna do with such and such? God has now spoken. What's going to happen? The invitation. So plan the invitation. You see, this is David here at the final part. And David inquired at the Lord saying, Shall I pursue after this truth? Shall I overtake them? And he answered, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. So now, he then asked the right question. Now here's, here's where we get to the nitty gritty, and, and, and like I said, um, I, 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 don't want, I don't want to get lost in the wording here, but I do want to make a point. Look at David. What would have you ask if you were David in this case? Okay, here's what I mean. So, you've gone through this hard time. This is not an exclusively long time. He's prayed. He sought God. God, help me. you got to give me strength. I'm going to believe you more than I believe my feelings right now. So he gets up. Abiathar, help me out. And Abiathar gets up and says, what do I need to do? What do you need, David? Let me help you. And my question would be this. Who did this? Who did this? You know what's interesting? I don't know if God would answer that question. His question is, God, what do you want me to do? You know that, that you don't realize that God might not be answering our prayers because we're still asking the wrong question. And he's not necessarily making us wait. He's waiting for us to change our question before he gives us an answer. Because sometimes my questions can be rooted in my selfishness and not be rooted in God's will. And what he then says to God, shall I ever take this truth? God, what do you want me to do? God, this is what you've done. You've brought me to this point. You've spoken to me. I've let your word speak. I've let you direct me. Now, God, what do you want me to do? That shows that he's willing to do anything. God would ask of him. You know, the 
reason that I believe you can make a discipline of your life of preaching to yourself is that you would come to church, and when you come to church, it comes with this willingness to do anything God wants you to do. It's already part of your life. It's what you do. You come to church, and it's not on the way to church. He better have a good one today, because I've had a bad week. I'll tell you what now. That was really rough, and I, you won't do it. What it is because the Holy Spirit of God, I'm not saying you're never going to need encouragement. I'm never saying that you're not going to need help. But what I am saying is, it ain't all on Him. You've got a Bible. You've got the Holy Spirit of God. <laughs> he can then speak to you individually. And when you have this regular discipline of them preaching, it doesn't come with this little kind of, I'll give that about a seven, give that about, see, this is what's so fatiguing about preaching is because there are some places you go and you know the only thing they're doing is judging you. Like, you might as well just go ahead and give, walk around the auditorium and give everybody a number. Go ahead and vote at the end of this message how good you think it was. Go ahead and vote how effective you think. I mean, really, it's become, listen very closely, it's become a subtle form of entertainment. Become entertaining. And because, I mean, in your life, if you go to the same thing long enough, you're naturally going to compare. And then when you naturally compare, you then have a favorite. Then you have a superiority. What I'm saying is we can take an area of worship that is supposed to be God-given for us to change and make it this is practice. This is an exercise. But I don't know, but I suggest to you for myself as well. Before I come to church, God, speak to me. Speak to me. <laughs> it's kind of like I encourage some teenagers. I said teenagers last week I was preaching on soul winning, and then and, and I preached a message about the one thing I want from hell. And I went to that passage, and as I was going to that passage, I was basically talking about the prayer of the rich man, how he prayed for his brothers. Man, what a passion that man had for his brothers. When he realized his seal, his fate was sealed, the next thing he did, I got five brothers. And I said, teenager, have you ever just prayed for someone to be saved? And you know what's so interesting? The teenager came to me after me and said, you know what, Brother Adrian, I really haven't prayed for people to get saved. But do you know what? God gave me the opportunity because I asked him for, please God, give me the opportunity to speak up for you to win this person for the Lord. What if I prayed about the things that God cared about? <laughs> what if I prayed for things that were totally undeniably biblical? No if and no a buts about. We know God was always saying. You know that. <laughs> God gave me the opportunity. God wants you to be more like him. So I don't think he's going to necessarily deny that prayer of God during this message. Speak to me. May by God's grace, God's strength, and God's help, may we learn the discipline that David did of God mounting the pulpit of our own heart and preaching to ourselves. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for church. We think we can gather together and worship you. We think we can hear sermons that stir our heart. But God, may it never replace the personal relationship we have with you. Lord, I pray for those who are anxious inside this room. Lord, who their mind wanders and it's hard for them to focus and their heart gets racing sometimes because of our current world and situations. May the word of God speak loud. Lord, may we learn more the discipline of digging in your word and letting your words be louder than the voices inside of our heart and the voices inside of our mind. God, help us to encourage ourselves in the Lord, our God. Because it's He who we put our trust in. 
Thank you, Father. You're done. I'll let you go through in Christ. We serve you pray all. Amen. Amen. Let's uh, close with singing just the chorus of Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Please stand. Let's just sing just the chorus as we close. you to find these sermons online you'll find them abby they were live streamed or were, okay so they were both live streamed at facebook today on our grace baptist church of marshall wisconsin page feel free to share them and uh, let those that are on your page that you're familiar with use it as an online opportunity to direct them to the truth the word of god i really appreciate your ministry brother thank you so much Amen. All right. Well, uh, as you go, once again, I don't know if it uh, looks like the offering was t already taken up, but uh, and they're, they're going to start counting in just a moment. So if you didn't get a chance to go up to the balcony and knock on the treasurer's uh, office there, and they'll be able to um, get that included. Thanks so much for coming today. We will see you online on Wednesday. Have a great afternoon.